What's up guys, it's Rowan and Brooklyn here from Artist Smart TV with another episode of Hashtag Help, a HSC English Lit program. Now this episode is part two of a, a two-part series. Um, in this episode, we are doing a deep dive into Ted Hughes' poem, Red. Now it's important to note that this features as part of HSC English Advanced Module A textual conversations. And so the reason this is a part two is that ultimately this is a, a paired um, you know, text with Sylvia Plath um, and her poetry. And so in episode number one, which if you haven't watched, check the comments, we'll make sure it's linked there. We dive into uh, you know her poem, Birthday Present. Now in this episode, we're gonna be doing a deep dive into Hughes's poem, Red. Now as part of module A, textual conversations, um, what is really critical is that um, we're really looking at you know the, the connections between uh, you know two texts. Um, and we're doing more than that though, right? Yeah. What are we needing to do here, Brooklyn, before we dive into the analysis? So last episode we talked about how there were sort of two sets of principles that are important to textual conversations. So the first set of principles is context, audience and purpose. And we really want to think about how um, the context, audience and purpose of both texts is influencing their meaning and what, what basically what they've written, the techniques they've used, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And that was particularly important, right, because of being able to identify the dissonance yeah. right, between so, texts. And that's the second lot of principles, right? You have your resonances, so that might be more where your thesis is based around, but then you have your dissonances, which will be, you, you, you'll need to talk about how both texts are different based on their context, audience, and purpose. So, Rowan, what is the context, audience, and purpose of Hughes's poem, and how is that different mm. to Plath? And so I think w what's really interesting is that, um, you know, Plath, um, you know, uh, uh, committed suicide, really, you know, unfortunately and sadly, and the public, as a result, really hated Hughes for it, because Hughes clearly features very prominently um, you know, sometimes very explicitly and then indirectly, right, in uh, Plath's poetry. And so if, you know, you're reading Plath's poetry, um, particularly if you read it first, and that's something that we'll, we'll chat about. And there's a lot of Plath fangirls, like, let me tell you, especially at that time, there was a lot of, like, you know how there's Taylor Swift fangirls now and they, they hate everyone who doesn't like Taylor Swift? Like, like back Kanye. then it was, yeah, well, <laughs> I didn't want to go too deep into it, but, um, yeah, back then Sylvia Plath was... I guess a bit of a, a Taylor Swift figure, like all, all the teenage girls loved her and that basically meant they hated Hughes, yeah, right? That's right. And so Hughes, when we read Hughes' poetry, if we look at context, it's, you know, particularly with, with Red, you know, this is post Plath death, okay, in terms of context. Secondly, it's really being written um, very intentionally to, um, you know, n not necessarily absolve, but certainly to change the narrative, right, in how the, the broader public view Hughes. So he's writing here to say, hey, wait a minute, um, this isn't, you know, Plath's ultimate sort of demise wasn't my fault. There was a whole lot of other stuff going on, and I want you to hear the other side to this story, essentially. Mm. And so he's, you know, in some sense really trying to shift that narrative so that he comes through in a, in a different light. And, and I can certainly speak to that because I remember reading Hughes' poetry first. You know, um, I read Hughes' poetry, and what we'll see, I think, is I think a perception of Plath as being someone that has serious mental health issues, right? And really, that's the cause of you know her ultimate suicide, not anything specific that, that Hughes did. And so, when I came to read Plath's poetry, I was already you know quite biased, I'll say, in reading it as like, okay, this person's crazy. Now, you had a different experience. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I read Plath when I was a teenager. I was honestly a bit of a Plath fangirl. Um, but, yeah, well, like, so I definitely started off with reading Plath. And then later when um, I, I sort of looked at this HSE module, I, I read Hughes as well. And I really don't like Hughes. I really don't like the way that he wants to insert. He, like, he just makes everything about him. He, like, tries to reshape Plath's narrative and make it all about himself. And it's like, just kind of get over it. <laughs> and so I think this goes to the heart of the module, right? In terms of textual conversations, it, it's really about how by reading in some sense one text, right? It can change um, how you interpret, um, uh, you know, another text and what you see and believe as the key ideas that emerge from that. And that's what we're going to try to unpack a little bit more in this analysis because, you know, in, uh, you know, our first episode with Plath, 
you know, what we really looked at as a sort of key idea that was emerging there was that, you know, Plath looked at the world through these, you know, dramatic binaries um, as a result of a sort of a heightened sense of emotion. And while that might be simple, there was actually a lot of complexity in that, in the ability to sort of hold these two competing ideas within your mind and within a single object mm. at the same time. And there's time. a paradox there, right? Because b- the word binary in itself assumes like two different things. But the fact that she sort of makes these binaries into one thing, that's paradoxical. Mm. And her paradoxical view of the world is very deep and rich and complex. And throughout Platt's poetry, like we're, we're about to look at this poem red, and the, the way that she deals with the colour red, it's it's so complex, it's so varied. Like, it, it does represent things like her her empowerment and her passion, but it also, um, in the poem Nick and the Candlestick, represents sort of this vitality of blood and sort of life. So, so there's just so much symbolism that Plath brings into the colour red in her poetry, and Hughes is going to simplify that a lot. That's right. And so this is where we see that the, the dissonance really start to sort of build, and that's because of that context, purpose, and audience that we discussed earlier, that that Hughes is writing uh, for a very different purpose and a very different audience. So with that in mind, what's the idea that we're going to be unpacking um, with, uh, you know, Red in Hughes' poetry? Yeah, great. So in Red, Hughes critiques Plath's violent oscillation between intense emotions and simplifies them ultimately through the colour of, or the colours of red, white, and blue, which he'll end up Mm -hmm. using. So in other words... What we're seeing is that he's really trying to define actually, no, there isn't this complexity. It literally is just this dramatic binary. It's, it's red, it's white, um, and so there's less complexity than what we perhaps see when we, we read Plath. Is that correct? Mm. And I think we'll see at the end when he, when he brings in Bloom. We'll go into more depth on that later. And maybe there is a little bit more complexity when he talks about that. But there, what's going on is he's sort of inserting himself into her narrative and rewriting that narrative. So... Cool. Um, so, example number one. Okay. So, um, our first example here is our room was red. The bookshelves escaped into whiteness. What's going on here? Yeah. Cool. So, um, what I want to talk about first in this is sort of the difference in form between Plath and Hughes. So, in Plath's poetry, her metaphors are crazy, right? She calls like she makes lots of like Holocaust references, which is like really problematic comparing herself to like a, a Jew in the Holocaust. Um, not not the best thing to do. Um, and a lot of people have like criticized Plath for doing that. But yeah, so she she sort of uses this really unrealistic, dramatic metaphors that don't they're like kind of so complex that they don't even really end up. Well, they do make sense, but in some really weird, convoluted way. And very in very symbolic ways as well, Mm. right? Um, Where I think what it seems like is happening here is, and we can see that from this example, um, the sort of uh, imagery uh, that that Hughes uses is very different, isn't it? Mm. Um, it, It's very much this like realistic, physical things that you you see. I mean, like bookshelves, Mm. like our room. Um, If... You know, if Plath is trying to move away from domestic banality and, you know, the things around us, it's almost like Hughes is really pulling towards it, right, in terms of how he's expressing himself. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't want to de-emphasize the fact that Hughes uses symbolism. Like, Hughes absolutely uses lots of symbolism throughout all of his poetry. It's just that the things that... He's sort of often using more realistic things to symbolise something deeper. I mean, you especially get that in a poem like Fulbright Scholars, where the whole, he's just telling a true story, but there's sort of symbols that we see in that true story. And here again, this whole poem is basically about how Plath really likes the colour red, and a lot of the stuff he talks about in the poem, it's it's just true stuff that happened in their lives. Um, but he uses that stuff um, symbolically. And, and there's a few moments where he does use some sort of darker symbols, but for the most part, and especially in comparison to Plath, He's a lot more, yeah, banal in his choices of, yeah, metaphors and um, symbols that he uses. And I think uh, part of that, um, you know, I think goes to this idea that, um, you know, his poetry f- feels or at least appears to be more grounded in reality and in contrast, therefore, mm-hmm. which maybe is, again, an intentional design in how he's constructed it, um, you know, the world that Plath is portraying and constructing is this unrealistic mm. Um, you know, slightly crazy world, Absolutely, right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, which is very much the narrative he's trying to shift. So I think through using these more realistic images, there's actually sort of a critique of the fact that Plath isn't as realistic. He's sort of saying, look, I'm using, like, I'm actually talking about things that really happen. Look at your poetry. You're just, like, 
what, 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 were, you, what were you on? Like, <laughs> um, so, right. yeah, but I also want to sort of come back to the specific quotes that we just looked. So we've looked at sort of the form elements of these quotes. And one thing that's really good to do when you're analyzing is you can sort of take a quote and look at um, how, like, the, the sort of what the the use of that technique throughout the poem what that's done so the sort of formic element what that's doing but then you also want to sort of go in very specifically to the quote and see what is that specific quote doing so we've, we've looked at the form element of symbolism and given an example for that but now I want to look at the exact ex the uh, specific example of our room was red and the bookshelves escaped into whiteness and what we have there is a contrast between the colors of red and the colors of white which we've already talked about but what are those colors symbolizing Ron? Yeah, so I think he read um, really gives a sense of, of violence, doesn't it? You know, like it, it's not, um, you know, I don't ever get the sense from here that this is a romantic red. No. <laughs> um, this is very much a, a violent red. And then, you know, the bookshelves, and what, what, what actually frames that is the word escaped, hmm. right? You know, I'm imagining most people are not going to want to escape if it was romance or something more positive in terms of what you might associate with red. Um, but because the bookshelves are escaping, right, we're really seeing that this red is this violence, this rage. And I think the way that he's actually framing that is his perception, it, it's not necessarily Plath's perception that they're escaping into whiteness, but it's like, so, so what, like, we have the fact that Plath painted their whole room red, um, and it's almost like he's seeing that as an attack on himself, and he's saying the only sort of escape from this horrible attack that she basically put on me of this this awful room is that I could look at the bookcase and that that was nice and white and maybe represent something more along the lines of her purity. That's right. So we start to see therefore this this binary that's been created, right? Yeah. That um, that Hughes is really trying to say, well look, this is actually like there, there wasn't this complexity necessarily, like this is what it was and it was a little crazy. Mm. And there's another uh, technique there which is a recurring motif. So we like very mo like we, we could have chosen a bunch of examples to show this idea of red and white because he uses the, the, the words red and white all throughout the poem. And so it's a recurring motif of you know this violet passion, anger, and then this sort of purity that's coming through um, exactly. in the white. Yeah. Great. So, so heaps to analyze there. That's and, right. Um, if you watched our last episode, we talked about our rule of making sure that we're linking our technique to the idea. So hopefully you can see that we've very clearly done that there. Great. So example number two, right, which again, rules of analysis, we're needing to then build on our idea. Um, so uh, here, um, the example is red with what you wrapped around you, blood red. So, um, obviously, we're seeing this ongoing motif of red. Yep. Again, we've got right? red. Um, what else is going on here? Yeah, cool. So, what I think is really interesting about this quote is we've got blood red. So, that's sort of like, I mean, blood red, yeah, I, I get the sense when you just said the words blood red, it's like kind of negative. It's like not, yeah. not the nicest image. But then he says, was what you wrapped around you. And when you think about something, when you wrap something around you, that's often quite a comforting image. It's like you, you wrap something around you to protect yourself or for safety. So I think what's really going on here is he's actually accusing Plath of wrapping herself in her violence, in her, in her anger, and and using that as a way to sort of, yeah, she, she's indulging in that. She's finding comfort in those things, which is a weird thing to do. And that sort of point to that idea that he does see her as kind of crazy. That's right, that she's got some, some real serious mental health challenges, definitely. All right, cool. So now we're going to move on to example three. And um, what we've got a couple of quotes there. So we've got this idea of a stiffening wound. And he, he's sort of using this to describe her red self. And also crisp gauze edges. With this, you know, we've got... Um, again, this this ongoing sense. I mean, you know, like a, a wound is, is, is typically, you know, it's blood. You know, it's, it's been bleeding, it's red. We've got this ongoing sort of continuation. I think for me, the, the word choice of stiffening is quite interesting, right? Because a sniffing wound is one that's, you know, that's been open for some time, but it, it's also sort of healing, mm. right? But it's also a really disgusting image as well. Yeah. And I think that that's... The main thing I wanted to point out there is obviously it's a really old wound as well. It's something that's been going on for a really long time. That's right. But yeah. It's um, it's also really grotesque. Like this idea of like this rough thing on on her arm or where wherever the wound is. It yeah, it, it's a disgusting image. So. But I think my sense is it's almost like, you know, the description of the wound is describing Plath itself, right? Mm, In that absolutely. because you know of of her, her anger and, you know, uh, the violence that at least he's portraying, right, is that in some sense what I get is it's a violence that's, that's hurting herself, right? 
and that she mm. is this wound. And even though she's wrapping herself in this blood red to protect herself, it's actually, you know, the irony of it is it's actually the thing that's deeply scarring her, mm. right? So I think this is where we get this idea of a critique of the red. So he's not just saying you are red and that's fine. It's not like you be you. He's not saying that at all. He's saying that you've created this sort of persona for yourself as red and like very violent and angry and that's actually hurting you and it's a big problem. And then he uses that sort of grotesque imagery of the um, crisp gauze edges, as I said, to like just emphasize the grotesque nature of what she has done to herself through her, mm. um, I guess, yeah, her dramatic binaries and the way that she sees the world. And I think there's another little thing I want to, well, two little things I want to pull out of you, like crisp gauze edges, like gauze for me, and I could be wrong on this, but my understanding, it, it's like a band aid. You know, like it's, uh, it's, there's it's a few rapid. different things that it can be, but like, so I yeah. think, I think that brings depth to the metaphor. To the, mm. to the symbol that he's using because one one of the definitions of gauze is like a, yeah. a band-aid. It's like a covering, right? That yeah. you would put over and what I want to pull out of that before we maybe look at the others is that I get a sense that what Hughes is trying to communicate is that, um, you know, there's this, this rage and this anger and it's creating this wound um, and plus at the same time sort of like trying to paper it over, right? Mm. And, and in some sense hide it, right? And hide it from... Uh, the world, and this is what Hughes is trying to do. He's trying to show, no, actually, there's this ugly ass wound under here, and it was nothing that I did. I actually want to add something to that, to that because he's actually saying the wound has crisp gauze edges. So what he's saying is, it's almost like she's trying to wrap herself up in this bandage. If we're going to take this metaphor mm. really far, but that bandage is actually a wound. So it's like this sort of super complex yeah, metaphor wow, that you cool. have there of yeah. this idea that um, she might think that she's, I guess wrapping herself up and we already had that image of wrapping yourself up but that that's actually the wound itself that she's wrapping herself up in so i guess mm. which well, is very destructive as a result yeah. which, and we see that right i guess that's the point now i think the other thing that's interesting about all of this in terms of hughes and this is why i feel more strongly for you because i read him first right is that i read this and i'm like you know it sounds like it was tough right mm. you know like it sounds like um, and I think for anyone that's perhaps lived with someone with, you know, mental health challenges, it can be at different times quite quite taxing and challenging. And that's sort of the sense I really get here, that Hughes is presenting himself as someone that's been very patient, very tender, very empathetic, very understanding um, of, you know, the, the sort of uh, rage and the emotions and the, you know, the, the craziness perhaps that he's trying to show that's happened here. And I think the, the language here of, you know, he felt her wound sort of shows that, right? He's really trying to say like, look, I, I was empathetic, I was there and I was supportive, but this was self-destructive. Mm. Um, and, you know, like, despite my best attempts, there was nothing I could do. And I think that also draws us back to that form point we made at the beginning about how he wants to present himself as someone who's like very nuanced, very realistic, very sort of, yeah, normal, I guess, in a way. Um, and I think that's also why he wants to bring in this idea of he wants to present himself as someone who is empathetic and, and felt her wound because he wants to show how Plath would kind of never do that. She would never say something like that in her poetry. And so that's a sort of interesting, uh, you know, I guess, juxtaposition between the two because really Plath is wanting to break out of the, the sort of ordinariness and, and, and wanting to, to be perceived as, as extraordinary. something extraordinary, right? Where... Hughes in this, you know, in, 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 in red at least, but certainly more broadly, is really trying to do the very opposite for himself. Like, he's trying to say, hey, like, I'm the everyday person, you know, like, I'm this normal person just like you, and what if you were in this situation? Now, final example that we're going to move to um, is, um, you know, a, a comment, really, that, that Hughes makes, um, where he says that blue was better for Plath. Yeah. Right. Well, he said blue is better for you yeah. as the actual quote. That's but. right. But, you know, because this is really a response to Plath and Plath's death and her poetry, um, you know, we're reading it very much as a yeah. direct response to Plath. Now, um, what, what is he going on about here? I mean, it's a little unusual because there's been lots of reds and whites mm. and all of a sudden now this blue colour just appears. Mm. And I think this is actually quite a difficult thing to understand because there's a lot of stuff going on with the symbolism here. And you're sort of like, well, what, what does blue actually represent? And I guess the way I personally say it is that semantically blue is representing calmness and that's sort of demonstrating his preference for nuance and peace. But then we were also talking about the idea that blue kind of represents sadness and melancholy and all those sorts of things. So I think there's lots of different ways we can interpret what the, the blue means here. And you can, in some ways, you can sort of interpret that based on what you want to argue in your essay. Because um, I think you could, and I think there's a case to say here that perhaps it was never going to be 
possible for Plath to be this happy-go-lucky person. And perhaps that was actually, you know, never the case. And when they met or at different points, there was, you know, still some of the melancholy and the sadness, but it wasn't this sort of violent, red, rage, anger, and it wasn't as self-destructive. Mm. And that's sort of how I took it as this, like, okay, it was blue. It was like, it's not like that I'm, you know, that, that Hughes was expecting that Plath was best in this state of perfection. It was more so just actually, we'll look like anyone, Plath wasn't perfect. Clearly, he's done a great job in <laughs> trying to communicate that. Um, but he was a place where, you know, with all her imperfections, you know, it was a place that was healthy and not just for her, but, mm. but for everyone else. And that's how I sort of took it. Yeah, so there's also some help that Hughes gives us in interpreting this blue, because he gives a lot of descriptions of what she was like when she was blue. And he talks um, about her pregnancy, which is potentially a bit problematic, because as we talked about in our last episode... Plath really hated gender roles. So the fact that he's brought in her pregnancy as, like, the best version of her, I think she might be slightly offended by it. I mean, as as we said, she did like being a mother. She, she loved her children, but she also hated being a mother at the same time. I think what's interesting there, though, as well, is I think my sense is that Plath is quite disconnected from people's true perceptions of her. Mm. You know, I mean, I think we see that in, in Birthday Present, right, in terms of the dialogue in her head, right, about um, what she feels people are going to, by the gifts they give, what that means in their perception. And I, I feel like while Plath might be viewing, um, you know, it's a bit of an irony, like some of the, the sort of very gender-specific roles that she was pushing back from because of how she perceived or how she thought other people would perceive her, I think there maybe is just this sense of irony that what this is is an observation that actually perhaps when she was in those roles, despite her own tension and angst with them, um, something else in her came out that was actually quite beautiful. And I think what you can see in that conversation we've just had is our very different perspectives on Hughes. I'm like, <laughs> that's terrible that he's inserting himself <laughs> into her narrative and like um, basically saying what she should be when she said she doesn't want to be this um, gender role. She, she doesn't want to be nice. She doesn't want to be a chocolate box. She doesn't want to be any of these sweet things. But then obviously Rowan was able to see Hugh's perspective there and the, the fact that um, maybe Hughes actually had quite like an insightful observation about Plath that she could never actually see for herself. And I think sometimes that can happen, right? Sometimes yeah, there can be things that we as individuals push back on um, uh, for whatever reason um, and actually it's um, where we're at our best. We just don't realise it. Mm -hmm. And then finally he finishes off by saying he characterises blue as the jewel that Plath lost. So in, I think, using this image of a jewel, something that's like very valuable, he's saying that her value was in her blueness. And that's, that's where I see a little bit of a problem personally because I don't think Hughes really has the right to say this is where you were the most valuable. Or this is where... Yeah, I think as well, though, the, the take I have, and I certainly get your perspective on him inserting, you know, he's inserting in, in Plath's narrative. Because I think, you know, in some sense, the idea of blue was better. For me, also, could be taken as this idea of, well, um, when you're more amiable and, you know, more conforming, shall we say, mm. right, that's when you're more likeable, right? And I can certainly see, which, you know, is not necessarily a good thing. And so I can certainly see where plus like, no, actually where I like myself best is when I am pushing boundaries and, mm. um, you know, trying to change stereotypes and, and, and whatever it might be. For me, though, when I look at Jewel, I actually take it as really Hughes trying to highlight that actually the Jewel was plus sanity mm. and she lost it. You know, like that, that's the problem, right? Mm. In that, um, you know, the blue was actually in the calmness and, and these traits of being a mother and, you know, the, the things that he, he connects is that in some sense, that's like the connection to reality. Mm. Um, and it's when that was lost, when this jewel was lost, well, you know, that, that's the problem, the sanity was lost. So I view that as being symbolic of, of just plus sanity. So overall, if we wrap this up sort of together now, these sort of different examples, I think... What we've certainly seen is Hughes attempts definitely to uh, really change the narrative. Right? Um, and we can see how, therefore, it does influence how we might read, uh, you know, plus poems themselves, right? Because ultimately, what we're trying to do here is we're looking at both the resonances and dissonances, but the module is about a conversation and about how these two come together and how we see different things in both poems, right? Yeah. As a result of the comparison, we certainly see a slightly different side of, of Hughes, you know, rather than this empathetic, tender, kind, ordinary person, we see maybe someone that's been, um, 
you know, a, a little self-serving, right? And really trying to, as Brooklyn has highlighted, insert into someone else's narrative. Mm -hmm. But equally, when we go back and we, we, we read Plath, we start to see, well, actually, here's someone with some serious mental health challenges. Mm -hmm. And... Um, we should be sort of mindful of that as we sort of read it. Um, is there anything else, yeah, you want to say as we sort of bring it together? Yeah, I just love to wrap up the, the resonant, like what, what both um, are doing that is resonant and mm -hmm. then what they're doing that's awesome. dissonant based on their context, audience and purpose. Yep. So the resonance is we both, in both poems, there is this idea of drama, the dramatic byronies, byronies, binaries. Binary. Although what, what is different about them is the perspective on those dramatic binaries. So Plath sees them as, I guess, in a lot of ways, a, a positive thing. Like she, she's... She likes them. She, and for her, those dramatic binaries are her escape from domesticity, and that's where the context comes in for Plath because her context is second wave feminism. The idea that she doesn't like the gender roles that her society has put her into, so she uses this sort of yeah these dramatic binaries to try and escape that domesticity. Then on the other hand, Hughes, do you want to explain what his dissonance to Plath? Is yeah, about? well, I think his dissonance to Plath is to very much highlight well, you know, actually look one. Um, there isn't this complexity here. Like it, it, it's it's red or white. It's this, this this rage and this anger. And while you're viewing it as Plath is viewing this as this escape, um, Hughes is really repositioning as this self-destructive sort of force. It's not an escape. It's not a comfort. It's actually something that's destroying Plath. Mm. And that actually the best parts of Plath are when you know she was embracing willingly or otherwise the more domestic parts of, of her role, um, which is quite different, right? Yeah, and we need to really link that back to the context and audience as well, because um, Hugh's context is obviously that he's been accused of sort of playing a part in Platt's death, and he's saying, well, no, it wasn't me, it was her mental health issues. And his audience is also, um, in many ways, I guess people like you, Rowan, who, who came to Hughes first, and he was actually able to convince you that Platt was crazy before you went to, to Platt. And I mean, I don't think he wants to position I don't think it's... He doesn't yeah. want to be negative about yeah, Plath, right. but he's just trying to say that this wasn't my fault. That's right. Yeah, and I certainly didn't get that sense either, you know, from reading his first, that oh, I'm just going to ignore everything Plath has written because she's this crazy person. And, and But it, I was certainly never at one point read Hughes, therefore, or viewed Hughes as the cause, mm. right? If that makes sense. You know, I was certainly a lot more empathetic and understanding with Hughes. And in reading Plath, that certainly changed, you know, it changed the perception, which I guess is... The point. Yeah. He achieved his goal. Awesome. I think that pretty <laughs> much wraps it, it, that it up. That wraps it up. So if you have any questions, guys, leave them in the comments below. We, we know that module A, textual conversations, is one of the more challenging modules. And to be fair, you know, I think at times, Plath and Hughes is also one of the more challenging pairings within module A because... Because there's two sets of poems that you need to do. So, like, there's a lot of depth that you need to go into. And I'll just make one note before we finish there. In a lot of module A... Um, it's often really good to have three paragraphs where you go into both texts in each paragraph. But I think because you want to go into a lot of depth in the poems for Plath and Hughes, a better way to structure an essay, specific, like, and I'm only talking about Plath and Hughes here, is to have four paragraphs and go, like, look at sort of one, one idea, then talk about Plath and Hughes with that idea, so two paragraphs there, and then talk about another idea, and then, and then Plath yeah. and Hughes, and yeah. yeah so awesome. four paragraphs all together. Great, so guys, if you have questions, leave it in the comments below, we'd love to help. If you haven't already, hit subscribe. We're gonna bring more videos like this as part of our hashtag help series. Um, and of course, um, we'll have loads of other video content as well. So we look forward to seeing you next week.